Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Uh, the title of tonight's messing is Double Crossed, Question Mark, an Examination of Easter. I'd um, also like to say hi to everybody who watches us and listens to us online. Um, appreciate it. Keep sending us a line to let us know that you're blessed as we try and serve you with, uh, with what's happening in our own hearts. So I want to look briefly at some things that are said about the cross and the death of Jesus and the terminology used. And uh, my perspective of the cross and concepts of its meaning have shifted, I have to be honest, um, since the days when I was first brought into church as a child, um, and I have reasons for that, and uh, we'll talk about some of those things, some of those things tonight. Um, question is, what really happened at the cross? We, we are all familiar that Easter is a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus and, and uh, a reflection on the cross. The question is, what really happened at, at the cross? Um, the death of Jesus is stated within much of the church's common narrative. If we're honest, is simply another form of ritual sacrifice to appease a God. Now, when you think about that for a moment, because my question would be, where is the uniqueness? Where's the amazing grace so often sung about if the, the narrative that we have mostly embraced is the reality, then it's just another story of ritual sacrifice. Someone being ritually sacrificed to appease the anger of God or the gods, which in this case one could argue it would be a ritual child sacrifice if Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. And I am concerned for this reason because I can see that model in, in any religion I want to look at. I can look at the Aztec religion and see ritual sacrifice promoted as the solution to the God's image of man. So my question is, if there is not a uniqueness in the gospel, why should we think it's unique? Now, we can throw things in there, but you know, it was for love that, 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 that God sacrificed his son, and all those kind of things. But at the end of the day, when you break it down, you still have the same model for the same reason, i.e. the gods are angry, their anger must be appeased, and it can only be appeased by a blood sacrifice. So into that model, we in our Christian narrative slide Jesus. Now, I, I think the sacrifice of Jesus is massively important. I think it's a reality, but I, I don't think it fits the model of the Aztec religion or the Greco-Roman religions or the Egyptian religions or, or any other religion that went before, which if we are not careful, we don't realize, but our expression only replicates those ideas, okay? of an angry God and the sacrifice being necessary to appease his anger. So where's the amazing grace in that? So did Jesus die? Yes, he did. I believe Jesus was the Son of God. I believe he did walk on the face of this earth. And I believe that he did die. Was there significance in his death? Absolutely. I believe there's massive significance in the death of Jesus. But another question, did God kill Jesus? Because from some models of what are called atonement theories, it would appear that the killer of Jesus was God himself. So within all those models, we have to ask some serious questions. Now, there's a wonderful thing that is unique to the gospel, and it's called forgiveness. See, the death of Jesus is not unique in its act. The emphasis people put upon an angry God being angry at men because we are sinners and his anger needing to be appeased so, 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 so God, because of justice, 
kills Jesus in order to appease his anger. There are all those things which are not unique, but what no other religion has, what no other belief system has, is this thing called forgiveness. Forgiveness is what makes the gospel unique. So the question is, what are the implications of forgiveness in relation to understanding the death of Jesus and the cross? I believe most Christians are deeply relieved to learn that the forgiveness of our sins is not dependent upon God killing Jesus. Now let that sink in. Some of you have been around longer than me, but I have to say to you that the forgiveness of our sins is not dependent upon God killing Jesus. You see, let's talk about this for a moment. If God needed the death of Jesus to forgive us, then he didn't forgive anything. When a debt is paid, no one will write to you saying, I forgive you. Is that true or is that not true? How many of you, when you pay your credit card bill at the end of the month, are expecting a letter saying to you, thank you for paying, I forgive you the debt? Those of you that have been fortunate enough to finish your mortgage, did you get a letter from the building society or the bank saying, thank you, I now forgive you because all the debt is paid? How many of you know that forgiveness would have to happen before that is paid? It would have to happen before you finalize the bill. It would have to happen in advance of that. Forgiveness would have to precede it because it's giving for something, okay? So, so the vital element of the work of the cross is actually covenant and not cleansing. I'm going to explain that in a little moment, you see, because um, when we have the emphasis on the cross is needed for God to cleanse us, and that then we can only be forgiven because we're clean, This unique thing of the gospel that we call forgiveness has been undermined because there is no forgiveness taking place. If you are clean, I am not forgiving you of anything. If what I have done for you has made you clean, I am not forgiving you of anything. There has to be a uniqueness to forgiveness that goes ahead of all that. So we have to now look at the implications because the common narrative is that that we were sinners, a debt had to be paid... God paid that debt in the body of Christ. We must accept that payment. We must repent and say sorry. And that when we accept what Jesus did for us, we are then forgiven. In which case, I question that is not even rational. You have not been forgiven anything. So therefore, our whole concept of the gospel has been polluted and diluted by the influences of other religious thinking that when we think we are just so theologically uh, correct and so accurate, actually the influences, the lenses through which we have viewed this has distorted what is a wonderful work that actually happened in the death of Jesus at the cross. So I said to you that the vital element of the work of the cross is covenant and not cleansing. Why is it covenant? Because God is a God of covenants. Okay, now what is a covenant? A covenant is an unbreakable promise. It's a promise with a commitment. And from the beginning of time, when God has gotten involved in the affairs of humanity, he has been willing to enter into a covenant. That is a promise with regards to what he will do, what his obligations will be towards us. Now, one of the classic examples of this I've talked about many times is in, is in the first book of the Bible, Genesis, in chapter 15, and a guy called Abraham who's having this amazing encounter with God And uh, in case you think that he was, you know, some religious uh, novel figure of the church of Genesis, he actually wasn't. He was from a place called Ur of the Chaldees, which was a city in what was then Iraq. And he was raised in an environment that really was full of false god worship and heathenism and paganism. So Abraham was called in a situation of atheism, heathenism, paganism, whatever he sat in that equation. And he had to make a journey to faith just like you or I have to make a journey to faith. Okay? And uh, that journey was fraught with issues and difficulties and failures. But, but what it did was showed him what God is like and what God is not like. For example, 
One day God said to him after he'd had a, a child when he couldn't have a child and he was promised, God said, take that child and sacrifice him. And Abraham did not blink an eye at that. Have you ever wondered why, if God told you, if you thought God told you, take your son, here's my son Joel, and, and take, him, take him to the top of the minster, because we don't have any mountains here in York, and sacrifice him to me, what do you think would, you would write about my comments on that? My, my terminology wouldn't be very holy and religious, I can tell you that. I think there would be some words come out of my mouth that would be uncooperative. But at the point of where he was supposed to plunge the knife into his son, it says God stopped him. Now, whether you believe the story is actual or metaphorical or whatever is not the issue. The issue is he was stopped. Now, the question is, why was he stopped at that point? Because child sacrifice to appease angry gods was a common knowledge to him. So when God says, I want you to kill your child... He did not blink an eye. He thought that's what the gods want, child sacrifices when they're angry. So why did God stop him? Because God was saying to Abraham, I'm not like that. You just thought I was like all the other gods. You just assumed that I want child sacrifice to appease my anger. But God says, Abraham, I am not like that. Now, before that, when he was being promised to have this child because he wasn't able to have kids and his wife was, wasn't able to have kids, and it's a story in its own right, he says God, God, God met him one night, and God met him to, to make covenant with Abraham. Now, without going into all the details of the story, because there's lots more that I want to say, in the making of this covenant, he had to kill some animals. Now, to us, that's a bit gory, and we wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't dream of you saying, okay, Chloe, you know, we're friends, let's kill some animals, and, you know, how you can get yourself put away for that now. Um, so back then, it was, again, Abraham didn't have to say, oh, God, explain to me what you mean, because in the culture of that time, making covenant with blood was the common accepted thing. The reason it was accepted was because if you made it with blood and death was involved, it was a sign that you were absolutely, totally, unreservedly, to the point of death, committed to this promise that you were about to make. Blood was a sign that you were committed to the covenant and you would not break it because blood was involved. So, so when he does the carcasses and the time comes to, to make this covenant, it says God put him to sleep. And while he was asleep, God walks through the animals in the blood. And when Abraham wakes up, God's already made a covenant. So the question is, who has he made the covenant with? Well, he hasn't made it with Abraham because Abraham was asleep. So the only person who went through the carcasses, through the way of covenant, was God. So God made a covenant with himself of which Abraham would be the beneficiary, right? Now, there was a reason for that. See, God, sharp, not like the other gods. He's thinking, if he makes a covenant with me, one of us is going to break this covenant. It won't be me, but one of us is. So what's the weak link to the covenant? It's Abraham. It's his humanity. It's the weakness of his humanity. So God says, I'll take that out of the equation and I'll make a promise to myself that I will keep this covenant and he will simply become a beneficiary of a covenant that I make with myself so that he can never break that covenant of blessing that I have made towards him. Now, the same thing I believe was happening at the cross in Christ and why it was blood, because what was important, blood screamed out, this is a covenant. And I didn't go on a cross as well as Jesus so that me and Jesus could make a covenant, he went to the cross himself, and in his broken body, it says God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. God was passing through the carcass again, in the blood of Jesus on the cross, saying, if you make a covenant with me, I know what's going to happen, it's going to get broken, because in your weakness, you won't be able to keep it. So, God is saying, I'll make a covenant, a promise with myself, of which you will be the beneficiary. But what you didn't make, you can't break. This is unique. You will not find this in any other expression of dealings of gods with men. So, so I believe that the, the cross, 
the work of the cross, the main element, the vital element of the work of the cross is covenant and not cleansing because God made a covenant with himself of which we are the beneficiaries, okay? Um, with himself so he couldn't break it and beneficiaries so he could lavish on us what the Bible calls the riches of his grace, okay? He's made you a beneficiary so he can lavish on you the riches of his grace. So, blood was not to appease God, but to enact his covenant. Now, those of you who've been in church for a while will be familiar with this kind of language. Those of you who haven't been around as long and not as familiar with the language, but you are as familiar with the concept that for something to be put right, the one who is angry must be appeased, okay? Something must happen to make them okay before they'll be okay with you. Well, the truth is God was okay with you anyway, okay? So I believe that in this, there is no de- that, that, that blood was not to appease God, but when Jesus gave his blood on the cross, he gave it to enact a covenant to tell you, I am making a covenant with myself that I can never break, of which you will be the beneficiary. That's the basis of the gospel. So there is no need for, for a death for forgiveness, but it's necessary for covenant. See, I'm not one of these. There are, there are some people who kind of teach the death of Jesus was just kind of unfortunate because he was saying the wrong things at the wrong time, and so the Romans killed him, uh, and that's just unfortunate, but actually there was no greater significance than the fact that what was happening, he was suffering the violence of a world, and he accepted that violence without without responding to the violence so it wasn't so much what he achieved in his death through his blood it was more that he just did the opposite to the system I I don't he did but I don't believe that that is the reason for the cross I think it undervalues and devalues what Jesus did he did go quietly he didn't fight violence with violence he fought violence with peace with acceptance But I believe you've got this amazing thread running through that says the real issue of the cross and why blood at the cross was because God's screaming out to humanity, still in a culture that understands the importance of blood, and he's saying, I am making a covenant with myself in the death of Jesus that I will not break, and you will be the beneficiary of that covenant. So there's no need for a death for forgiveness, okay? So, so God didn't need the death of Jesus to forgive you. Otherwise, as we've already said, it wouldn't be forgiveness. Let me give you a Bible verse for those who'll be listening and watching saying you don't use the Bible. I'm not going to use a lot of Bible because most of you would find it incredibly boring if I just went verse after verse. So I'll just drop a few in. We have lots of verses, but I'll just drop a few in. Hebrews 13, verse 20 through 21 says, May the God of peace who through, listen to this, the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, verse 21, equip you with everything good for doing his will. So what was the blood? It was the blood of the eternal covenant. There you go. There's just one verse to help you understand. It's the blood of covenant, and that's what brought back Jesus from the dead so that he could make sure that you as a beneficiary of his covenant got what was coming to you. But you see, you were raised to think you're going to get what's coming to you. That meaning the judgment of God, the wrath of God, the punishment of God. But I propose to you, you're going to get what's coming to you because what's coming to you is the benefits of a covenant that God made in Christ. We are people here to receive the benefits of that, not the punishment of a misinterpreted representation of why God sent Jesus. So, you receive forgiveness by faith. We understand that. In, in any walk of life, you can only receive forgiveness by faith. You have to have faith that the one who is forgiving you is really forgiving you, that it's not a trick. Now, the reason I call this message double-crossed is because I think a lot of my life I've been double-crossed, right? I've been double-crossed over the cross because I didn't realize some of these principles, that you receive forgiveness by faith, yes, you receive it by faith, 
but it has no impact on its givenness. Now, there's a word I made up, right? So whether you receive it by faith or not, it still has givenness, because that's what forgiveness does. It's given, it's not earned, it's not deserved, it's not accumulated, it's given. Forgiveness, forgiveness. Anything that makes it earned, anything that makes it deserved, immediately discredits it because it's no longer forgiveness. It becomes a reward or a payment. So I propose to you that when you, your, your attitude is to receive forgiveness by faith, okay? I have been given forgiveness, I receive it, okay? You receive it by faith, no impact on the givenness. Forgiveness granted in response to a sorry, which how many of us were taught, if you say sorry, I will forgive you. Then I would say to you now, then you have no intention of forgiving me. Because once I say sorry, what you are doing is you are giving retribution, not forgiveness. Okay? Retribution is paying back. So if you, say, if you say sorry, I'll forgive you, that is called retribution, right? I am giving you back something for what you've done. Forgiveness can never be retribution. What is retribution is when we have judgment and condemnation and punishment are retributions that come because of something, but forgiveness comes because of nothing, that is why the gospel is based not on those old models that says God had to kill Jesus. Jesus was necessary to die because an angry God needed his anger appeasing. And because of that, if you say sorry, God will forgive you. Now, some of you have been around a while. Again, your minds will be turning over some scriptures about repentance and, and all that stuff. Listen, go and look at them in the light of this and really, really look at them through another lens, the lens of forgiveness, and you will see that some of them are not saying what you thought they said. Now, there is still a cleansing. There is still a work of the cross, but you'll see the primary work is covenant and that you're forgiven before you ever say sorry. And so we don't repent or say sorry to God to be forgiven but what happens when you realize you are forgiven, you tend to want to say, sorry, and repent, change your mind, because it's a response to, not a, not a cry for. So I hope you're understanding this, that forgiveness granted in response to a sorry or some kind of repentance is retribution, not forgiveness. Do you understand that? Now, one last thing on forgiveness. Forgiveness invokes an immediate change to a person's status. Let that sink in. Forgiveness invokes an immediate change to a person's status. So you may be guilty, but once I forgive you, you are no longer guilty because I forgave you, so your status has immediately been changed. So if in, if in Christ God forgave us to reconcile us to himself, in the moment he forgave us, it would be true to say then that there was immediate change to our status. The problem is you have not realized the status that you hold before God. See, I told you this last week. Nowhere in all of the Gospels, in the Acts of the Apostles, the story of the early church, or the writings of Paul are we told to confess our sins. We have to wait till James and John, and even then, James is questionable anyway. Which, ask Martin Luther. Don't ask me, ask Martin Luther. Um, John, there is a context that's very clear to when John says, if we confess our sins, and it's not what you think it is, okay? So Paul, who wrote more than a third of the New Testament, almost, well, two-thirds of the New Testament... And all the Gospels never tell you to, conf to confess your sin, okay? What they tell you to confess, if you believe in your heart 
and confess with your mouth that God raised Jesus from the dead, you understand and experience salvation. All the confession is about a condition that we already walk in. And so I said last week, which I think is very important, I was raised very much around what were known as word of faith teachers, who were very big in bringing us back to the understanding that we need to confess the good stuff. It's not all weeping and wailing and moaning, oh, what a worm I am, what a sinner I am, this is terrible. God, if you could only just find two minutes in your day. You know, we were told that we have the promises of God, like Abraham had the promises of God. And so I was taught, if you're sick, you don't confess, oh, I'm really sick, it's terrible, I don't know what's going on. I was taught, confess that in Jesus' name you are healed. Confess that you're well because of what he has done. I was told if we were struggling financially, you don't confess, oh, it's terrible, we're going under, I'm poor. I was told to confess, he is my provider. He is the one who supplies all my needs. But then I was taught in the context of sin to confess how terrible a sinner I was. So if it was confess the healing, confess the provision, then is it not also true that you confess the righteousness that is already yours, that is a gift of God to you because of Jesus? So if confessing health as he has, has seen me come to he- well, in fact, health is better than healing. I, I have confessed and moved into health more times than I could mention. I've confessed and moved into provision at times when it was absolutely supernatural. But in the same way, when you're struggling with sin, do you confess how terrible a sinner you are, or do you begin to confess, I am the righteousness of God in Christ? I have been given righteousness. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because in it, a righteousness is revealed, which is by faith from first to last. The righteousness of God revealed in me. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, so the issue is, forgiveness invokes an immediate change to a person's status. God sees you now as forgiven. Because we've already, I've tried, I've done my best to explain to you if it requires anything else, you're not forgiven. And then what you think you got, whatever it is, is not forgiveness, it's retribution. But we're told that we are not saved by works. Or we would boast, or I repented, I said sorry, I changed my heart. But we're saved by grace through faith. That's not from ourselves. It's the gift of God. God already sees you righteous. God already sees you forgiven. And when you invoke that forgiveness in your own life, you will see that your status has already changed. Okay? And when you realize that, you'll realize I'm a blessed man. The favor of God is upon me. Okay? The book has been closed. It's the year of the Lord's favor. So let's say another couple of things. Sadly, when you interpret the bulk of evangelical thinking on the gospel, it leads only to one conclusion, that we needed Jesus to save us from God. These are important statements. See, if God is angry and God is going to judge you, then your need of Jesus is to save you from God. Because it's God who's going to do what he's going to do that will make you eternally damned if that's what you believe. So therefore, Jesus has to save us from God. How many of you, when, when you hear it like that, think, huh, that can't be right. But the greater context of how we presented it is that Jesus, now we can say, no, he's saving us from our sin. Yeah, but why? Because you say sin separates us from God because God can't look upon sin and God is angry at sin. So God's anger has to be appeased. So therefore, God's anger has to be taken out on a sacrifice. So Jesus becomes the ritual sacrifice to appease the anger of the gods so the gods can kind of smile on us. Do, Do you see how there are problems with this? But there are no problems with the uniqueness of the gospel of the God who forgives, who seals the covenant in the sacrifice of Jesus that will stand for all eternity and that within that covenant provides the flow of cleansing. The cleansing that comes then is one that frees us from our captivity, from our bondage. And we could talk about 
about how redeem means to free from bondage and captivity. So, if God needed payment for the sins of humanity through the cross, God was the problem. If you're another kind of person who thinks Satan needed paying, then God has a problem. If God needed payment for the sins of humanity through the cross, God was the problem. He, he, but once you've forgiven, you are not the problem. Therefore, you don't need payment through the cross because that's not the problem. Whatever the problem is, that ain't it. If Satan needed paying, God has a problem because that would make Satan an equal and opposite force to God who God had to kowtow to and say, well, here's the payment. I'll pay you Jesus. Did you see how this stuff has real problems? If God can't forgive without the cross, then God is a problem in my eyes. That God is a problem in my eyes. And that's why I've said about atheism, when atheists say, I don't believe in God, and I say to them, I don't believe in the God that you don't believe in either. Because that's not the God who I serve, it's not the God who I know. Colossians 2, 13 through 17, listen to this. When you were dead in your sins, so when did this happen? While you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, has some Jewish language for you there. God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Having cancelled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. That was all happening, but when were you made alive? In Christ. What happened? He forgave us all our sins. And having disarmed the powers and authorities of all kinds, of every space, time, spirit, whatever, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross, Therefore, don't let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. In other words, all the rules that you thought applied to this God who you had misrepresented actually don't apply because they're not the things that he's looking for and he's not judging you on those things. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. So a few more minutes. Another question, is sin a sickness to be healed or a crime to be punished? Is sin a sickness to be healed or a crime to be punished? Because your answer to that question will determine how you perceive the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. If it is a crime to be punished, then you will naturally lean towards somebody's got to be punished and Jesus had to be punished for my crime. Again, the reverses, but we can talk about those. Or if sin is a sickness, you say whatever was happening, it was giving healing to the nation. Something was flowing out that is healing to the nation. So whichever theory we engage, whichever one you have tonight, it must leave room for divine forgiveness and pardon. Otherwise, it's wrong. It must leave room for a grace that is obscenely good and scandalously benevolent and powerfully life-changing. See, we have problems in our human thinking to separate the death of Jesus from a framework of legal and economic thinking, and that's the problem. Um, the, the biggest influence that most of us came under who were around church was Jean Carlin. Uh, I use his French name because John Calvin doesn't sound half as, you know, romantic as Jean Calvin. Uh, but Calvin is the one who introduced what, or really propagated something that was created by a guy called Anselm that, that we know as penal substitutionary atonement. Now, this was in the 16th century. John Calvin was a lawyer. So therefore, when Calvin looked at Scripture, he starts to read it through the eyes of a lawyer. So he sees the world as a courtroom, um, God as a judge, you know, people as the defendants, and therefore, there has to be a way to satisfy what he feels is the requirements of the law. Well, where there is forgiveness, there are no requirements of the law to satisfy are there? So the question is, did he forgive us or didn't he forgive us? 
And if he did forgive us, when did he forgive us? Because as I've explained to you, if it's after you said sorry, then you haven't been forgiven. You've had retribution for the act that you have done. I propose to you the wonder of the gospel and what makes God the ungodlike God and Jesus the unmessiah like Messiah is that he freely forgave us all our sins and that the cross was not so that he could... The cross was to show us a covenant has been made so that all the benefits of this forgiveness can flow to you as people. So, legal and economic thinking. So, economic because it's about, well, you know, there's a debt that has to be paid. That's called economic. Or in the legal thinking, there's a crime that has to be punished. A crime that has to be punished, a debt that has to be paid. Uh, They're economics and legalities. So here's, listen to this. Love in the courtroom is not a reality. The rule of law overrules love. When have you ever heard a judge in a courtroom say, Oh Danny, I love you, so I'm not going to impose a penalty upon you. Will you ever hear that? Why? Because if you have a courtroom scenario, the rule of law always overrules love. Do you understand? Okay? Stay with me. Stay bright. And love determining the wheels of banking is a nonsense. We're all just coming out of understanding that bankers don't love you. They are not doing things in order that you, the common person, can be better off. Right? They're not doing it. So, so, so love determining the wheels of banking is a nonsense. So don't interpret scriptures like Christ died for our sins through an economic model. It is not about paying back an economic debt. Okay. If justice required the death of Jesus, then God is answerable to a higher law. But if we told the only higher law is love, what then? See, we preach the highest law in the universe is the law of love. But if in the context of the cross you say that justice required the death of Jesus, then love is not the highest law. The legalities of retribution becomes the highest law that Jesus has to be punished because a debt, a legal debt has to be settled and therefore love is not the highest. Do you get that? Can you see how there's a complication here? Love is not the highest. Where love is the highest, love overrules law. So the love of God in making covenant overrules the law that demands sacrifice for appeasement. Does that make sense? So when Jesus died because of the love of God for humanity, because in his love he was overruling the rule of law, saying that love is greater than the rule of law. So God so loved the world that he gave his son. Whoever believes in him doesn't perish. It stops the rot, okay? But has everlasting life, okay? And we could go and explain that, but I'm not going to get stuck there. So nearly done. If a ransom was involved, because this is another thing, Christ died as a ransom. If a ransom was involved, then kidnapping must have taken place. Of course, you only play a ransom when somebody's been kidnapped. Is that true or is that not true? A ransom for kidnapping. If redemption was involved, which is another Bible word, a slavery must have been in place. Because you only pay redemption where there is slavery. Now, here's my main issue when you really look at Scripture. It talks about the fact that we were kidnapped and enslaved by the law. The law that demands that by our own performance, we earn the favor of God. Okay? So, when you begin to look afresh at words like ransom and redeemed, which I've studied hard and long, you realize that they are talking about our enslavement, first of all, to the law. You must and you must not. All that 10 stuff that we thought was the way to live that's really showing you that how you can't live because you're not capable as a human being. You need forgiveness and extraordinary grace. And also because we are captivated by a worldview 
only accounting for our fleshly existence. That's what he says, you have become enslaved. You are slaves to the flesh, a different worldview. So ransom and redemption, something. Okay, nearly done. Ephesians 1, 7 and 8. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins. So we have redemption. What does that redeem us from? It redeems us from what we're enslaved to. To. It's actually got nothing to do with how God sees us because of our sin. It's a buying us back from what we are a slave to. That's what redemption is. It buys you from what you are a slave to. We were slaves to the law. You must and you must not. Right and wrong determining who we are and our personality. And we are slaves to the mindset of this world. In him we have redemption through his blood because the covenant has set us free from that. I love this, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. So what's the measure of the forgiveness? The measure of the forgiveness is the riches of God's grace. That's pretty good forgiveness. Grace being that that you have not earned. Grace being undeserved favor that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Now, what it means when it says he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding, it means that God is wise and God is understanding, so he understands you perfectly. And in understanding you perfectly, he didn't say, oh, this is terrible. You were born in sin, you're only sin, it's terrible, I'm gonna have to kill my son in order to fix this. With all wisdom and understanding, knowing exactly who you are, let's back work this. He lavished on you the riches of his grace because of the forgiveness of your sins, which he had brought you out of the old way of thinking. So here's where I want to finish. Luke 15 has an amazing story. You may know it as the prodigal son. It's a terrible title for what is really a story about a father's love. It should really be called the father's love, not the prodigal son, because the the son is not the center of the story. The father is the center of the story. And when you get misled, you think the son's the center of the story because you're caught up in all that wrong understanding of how to express the work of God in Christ. But when you understand that, you realize the story's always about the father. It's always about the father. We play a part in what the father is doing, not him playing a part in what we're doing. So you know the son asks for his money and his dad gives him his money, he doesn't fight him, he says off you go son, see how that works for you. Which I've found is probably the best response to people who are wanting to go do their thing, go do your thing, see how that works for you. Uh, You know, let's get there sooner rather than later. And then of course the the boy spends all his money, he's been with the prostitutes, you know, he's, he's, he's done his gambling thing, he's done, you know, he's drunk himself silly and... Now his, his friends, his Facebook friends, uh, have, all, have all unfriended him and blocked him now because they're not getting what they want. So he finishes up in this, in this uh, horrible situation for a Jewish boy, which is, you know, when, you, when we read like he was feeding the pigs in a foreign country, like that's like, well, he was just feeding pigs. But to the Jewish mind, that was, you couldn't get any lower, you know, Pigs to the Jews were unclean under the law. So for you to be among pigs and eating what pigs eat, that was like this. You can't get any lower than this. It can't get any worse than this. And he says he comes to his senses and realizes even my father's servants are better off than this. So he rehearses his, I love this, he he rehearses his prayer of repentance. Okay, I'll go to my father and I'll say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me as one of your hired servants. He's rehearsed the prayer. But the wonderful thing is, his dad never lets him pray the prayer. Why? Because he's already forgiven. Because the prayer is not necessary for the father's forgiveness. Because forgiveness is given already. And when the son realizes that he is forgiven, the truth is, right from that very moment, his condition totally changes. Forgiveness invokes an immediate change to his status. Why? Because instead of the dad saying, you bad son, you terrible, you were born in sin, you were, I knew you were wrong in the moment you came out of your mother's womb, 
and you know, you, I need a proper repentance. You've gone as low as you can go. You've dishonored my name. You've dishonored the house. His father never does that. The first thing his dad does is he puts, he puts shoes on his feet and a robe on his back, right? Now, what you might not realize is that if you didn't wear shoes, that showed what you were. You were a poor servant who had no inheritance, So the fact the father put sandals on his feet was saying, you have an inheritance. You're royalty. You're not scum. You're not not a a cast off. You're my son. Shoes on his feet immediately said, right, you're not going to have the bloody walk of this way. You're having shoes on your feet to show that you belong and that you are somebody, right? Remember, he hasn't been able to pray. Oh, you know, please forgive me. I'm really sorry. And Father has not given him chance, right? Because forgiveness is already at work. He puts a robe on his back, covers his filth, his dirtiness, all that he is in. And he puts the ring on his finger, which was like the, the signet ring of, of authority. It was like the king's ring that you did the seals with. So he immediately gave him back the same authority that he had before he left. That's what forgiveness does. So his dad didn't say, ha, huh, see this? you got to work up to this, okay? I'm going to put that there. And uh, when I've seen that you've become a better boy, when, when I see that you've mended your ways, when I've heard your prayers for forgiveness, when I've heard all your confessions, then we'll see. But no, when does he put the ring on his finger? Soon as he meets him, where's he met him? He hadn't even got back to the house yet. The father meets him. We've got shoes on his feet, a robe on his back, and he's got the ring on his finger. So when the boy walks back into the house that he left however long before, he looks the same when he walked in as the day that he left. So nobody could ever say about the boy, oh look, he's a total failure because he had the father's robe. He had the shoes of belonging on his feet. He had the ring of authority on his finger. It was like he'd never left. Why? Because that's what forgiveness always had towards the boy. And the father's waiting with the shoes, he's waiting with the robe, he's waiting with the ring. Why? Because he is a beneficiary of the covenant. And then he takes him home and he says, let's fill, kill the fatted calf and rejoice for my son was lost and he's found. He'd gone but he's back. And so they killed the best calf and they had a party, right? Not six months in, not after seven years probation, not after prayers of sorriness and repentance. Why? Because this gospel is based on God's forgiveness towards humanity. Your job is simply to embrace and receive that wonderful, outrageous forgiveness and live as a beneficiary of the covenant that God made with himself concerning you. And understand that the cross was simply screaming that and saying, this is about covenant, not about cleansing. Now, the wonderful thing is, in the covenant, there is cleansing. I have absolutely no doubt that when the boy got in the house, the first thing he did was throw off the robe, sandals off the feet, in the bath, right? Why? Because cleansing is in the process. But before that comes forgiveness. Before that comes acceptance. Before that comes a change of status because that's the uniqueness of the gospel. So the question is then this, a father's response to a returning son, it's all favor, it's all blessing, it's all reconciling, it's all restorative. So how should we then live? We should live as beneficiaries of an unbreakable eternal covenant as not just good sons but loyal friends because we've been made friends of God, brothers of Jesus and then as a channel of healing for the whole world. That's why the word gospel is what is used to describe this message, because gospel means good news. Good news. It's not just the good news that thankfully by the skin of your teeth, an angry God had a ritual sacrifice and managed to... Get rid of his anger so you can approach him and be okay. It's bigger, it's better, it's greater, it's more wonderful than that. And I propose to you that the rule of love 
overwhelms the rule of law and God loves us and God is love and out of that love has come the most overwhelming, wonderful, remarkable, exceptional forgiveness that flows over everyone in here tonight. Some of you can't forgive yourself and yet God in heaven, the righteous judge of all men, has already forgiven you. And when he sees you, your status has already been changed in his eyes. You are forgiven. Whatever you've done, wherever you've been, however bad that worked out, forgiveness is what he has imposed upon you. I believe the response to the gospel is when we accept the forgiveness that has already been given towards us. God in Christ reconciling us to himself and it's there for all of us. I believe that favor and blessing and I don't believe that retribution, I believe that reconciliation and restoration is what flows out of the Father's heart to us tonight and I want you to live in that place as a beneficiary of a covenant that will last forever, was made by God with himself on your behalf so that you can say, I receive. Be the prodigal tonight. Be the boy. Be the younger son. Accept the shoes. Accept the robe. Accept the ring. Accept the fatted calf. And thank him that as you walk into the house, you walk in as a son already forgiven, nothing else required, and that everything that is provided is to bring to you the benefits of the covenant that God has made with us and towards us in Jesus' name. All right, let's just pray. Father, thank you for such an amazing covenant. I pray every heart and life will receive it tonight, that we'll enter in, that we live as beneficiaries of this unbreakable covenant, that we live as not just good sons, but loyal friends towards you, the Father, and that we will become a channel of healing for the world, because freely you have received, you said, Jesus, freely give. So as freely as I've received this forgiveness, Father, I want to give this forgiveness I want to give it in immeasurable amounts, flowing out to the hearts of people to show them the covenant that will last forever that you have made on our behalf, of which we are the beneficiaries. Thank you for so great a salvation. Thank you for such good news. And thank you that it's our news tonight because it was all done for us on our behalf. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, there you go. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support the rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.